Um, welcome everyone to our Tuesday night meeting. You are with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Uh, this is our fourth Tuesday of the month. So this is our meeting, our community meeting for the fight against data-driven policing. We're very glad to have you all joining with us. Uh, this is our first meeting of 2023. Um, so we're really excited about that. And um, sorry, my name is Tiff. I use they and them pronouns. Um, I've been a part of this fight against data-driven policing for a while now, maybe five or six years. I'm really glad to be um, here with us this evening. I'm um, joined by um, co-facilitator of this space, uh, Hamid. Um, we're also supported by a lot of additional folks who do work um, to support this space and also support the different working groups, um, Matios and Shakir, um, and additional folks uh, doing a lot of that work. Chris, we're glad to have you with us. And yeah, so tonight we are going to be talking about, um, as we think about our fight against data-driven policing in this year, uh, we're going to be talking about one of the main components of that, which is uh, SARA projects. And we'll get into what those are. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about how this is being used in Skid Row in the Skid Row community. And the reason that we are kind of centering our fight there as we think about our fight against data driven policing in 2023 is that uh, for a number of different reasons, one is that this is where we are based. This is um, our home and the community that we are accountable to. Um, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition is a part of uh, LA Can. We are housed within the LA Can um, community right there in, um, in Skid Row. Um, and so this is a part of the community that we are part of. And then also um, this is uh, an area that um, is the most heavily policed, some of the most heavily policed areas in the world. And then additionally, this is also a continuation of work that we've done previously in looking at how predictive policing and how data-driven policing was being used in Skid Row. So this is a continuation of that. And just welcoming additional folks. Hey, Pancake. Um, glad folks can be joining us. We're just kind of getting started going over the agenda. And um, I'll just pause and and also just encourage folks to ask questions as we go along. Like if we are, if folks have a question about maybe one of the terms or one of the things that we are talking about, please do drop it in the chat, raise your hand. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just see if there's any other questions or Hamid, anything to add. Welcome back, by the way, we're glad to have Hamid joining us, not really in person, but more locally than recently. Thank you. Thank you, Tiff. It's good to be back and uh, excited about uh, setting up our fight for this year. And uh, Sarah is, uh, well, <laughs> there's a whole lot to be said about that. So, yeah, thank you. Right on. Okay, well, let's get into it. So the way that I thought that we would kind of structure our conversation tonight is we'd start out by um, just touching on like, what is data-driven policing and what have been just a, a, some of the main programs that LAPD has been has been using in the past. So just reminding us of that and how those were being used in Skid Row. Um, a lot of that is covered, well, all of that is covered actually in a report that we released in, I don't even remember what year it was. It was November, it was 2021, right? November, 2021, automating banishment. Uh, folks can find that online at its own website, um, let's see, automatingbanishment.org. And um, yeah, so we invite you to check that out. And then, um, but yeah, so we'd start by just reminding ourselves of that, how it was being used in Skid Row, and then talking about what is Sarah, what are these, um, what, is, what is the data-driven policing program that is being used today? Um, and then looking together at, uh, the Sarah reports that we've gotten that do talk about where it's being used in Skid Row. 
and we are um, looking forward to being joined by General Dogon at some point later in the conversation as well. Really glad to have Pancake and, and other members from the community joining us, and we'd love to hear folks' thoughts and feedback in terms of you know, as we're looking at this and looking at some of these locations, just getting a better understanding of what that means and and what is what is um, what are in those um, what are at those locations essentially. So that's kind of the overview of what we'll do. So we'll start by uh, just reminding ourselves again. Sorry, let me just be checking the chat. Okay, for some reason I just can't open my chat. There we go. No. I apologize. Okay. All right. So uh, now we will get into, yeah. So in terms of data driven policing, um, this is essentially those policing programs that use that claim that they are data driven to justify who they're policing and where they're policing. So um, this is something that police have uh, has kind of emerged in a response to, um, you know, accusations of the police being racist, uh, accusations about where and who was being policed. And so what has emerged kind of more solidly over, you know, a number of decades and years has been this claim of policing coming from a place of being uh, evidence-based or data-driven. Um, and so this kind of allows police to pretend that um, that there is no bias, you know, there is no racism on their part, but this is that they are policing these areas, they are policing these specific people because based on data and data analysis that they have done. So that's the claim. Uh, some of the main programs that uh, LAPD has been using um, in recent years, one is Operation Laser, of course, uh, one is PredPol. And so op both of these essentially designated areas, they used crime data to designate areas as being more criminal or being more likely that crime would be committed in those areas. And then using that as an excuse to um, attribute uh, or assign more resources, more policing, more tactics, to those areas under the guise that these were areas that were more criminal or that crime was more likely to occur there. Um, Operation Laser additionally had a um, person-based aspect to it where they were focused on who are the chronic, so-called chronic offenders in an area. Uh, these were people who were deemed to be more likely to commit crime um, based on information that LAPD PD supposedly had. But what we came to understand as we exposed the program is that this a lot of this was just based on like so-called like hunch, hunch based policing um, based on who they thought was criminal, um, not actually based in anything real. And um, so that's those were some of the programs that LAPD did have in place, Operation Laser and PredPol. Um, that was kind of a really quick overview of those. So I'll just pause and see if folks have any questions on that. But those were some of the main ones. Those have been shut down. Uh, we did shut those down through a lot of community-based research, organizing, pushback, um, building power together. And we did shut down Operation Laser after exposing the harm of the program that was shut down in 2019. PredPol was discontinued. It was dropped by LAPD in 2020 uh, as a result, again, of community um, feedback and pressure. And um, then, so thank you, Matios. Yes, that was uh, Laser, Los Angeles Strategic Extraction and Restoration was what that stood for. Um, and then what took the place of those um, actually, before we get into that, let's take a look first at, um, we do want to talk about, so before we get into that, I'll just back myself up. We'll talk about Operation Laser and PredPol and how those were being used in Skid Row, because what we're going to do in the second part of the meeting is then look at um, what are the areas that are being targeted uh, today with Sarah. Okay, so right now what we'll do is we'll hop over to a map that was created by Chris. Uh, bear with me a moment. I wonder if anyone else would do a better job of sharing this map. I feel like my screen is so small. Um, do I have I any share. 
<laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Uh, my screen is small, so I sometimes have trouble navigating, but essentially what we wanted to do, Shakir, at this point was, was to take a look at the map that was created for us um, for automating banishment that folks can take a look at on our website and take a look at the area of Skid Row. Yeah, I got you on me, but uh... I can also share. Oh, oh, there's Chris. Cool. I didn't realize Chris yeah. here. Chris made this map. I'm just, I'm just. Do you want to share that one or the new one, Tiff? That's what. Yeah, you want. I was trying to pull up the new one. Um. Well, you know what I, because what I thought we could do first is, why don't we first look at this one? Because mm -hmm. what I wanted to do was wait a second. What well, makes more sense? Um, okay, let's start with looking at this one. Because well, does the new one have all the same pieces of data on it in addition to the Sarah stuff, Chris? Uh, except hotspots. Okay. Yeah, so, and what we'll do is we'll look at this and then before we then talk about what is Sarah and then we'll bring in that piece and then we'll go to Chris's new map, which is a, a map that, that Chris uh, created to look at the Sarahs as well. So again, just getting us situated, this is looking at um, a map that was created by Chris um, to show us where in the community Operation Laser was um, targeting areas. So um, what we're looking at is the downtown Skid Row area. And what we see here, I'm sorry, I think we're zoomed out again. Yeah, so what we see here, essentially, um, if we're looking at kind of this larger quadrant, so these are the historic boundaries of Skid Row. So that's going from Main Street to Alameda, and then from Third Street to, I believe it's Seventh. So these are the historical boundaries of the Skid Row area. Uh, when we look at where um, these data-driven policing programs were targeting these previous programs, uh, what we want to draw our attention to are the laser zones. So the laser zones were lined up. These are the red boxes that we're looking at. Um, they were lined up kind of all in one area um, along 5th, 6th, and 7th Street, running from the block between San Pedro and San Julian. And just to remind us, so when an area is designated as a laser zone, again, this is police determining that this is an area that is more likely for a crime to be committed. It is deemed to be more criminal. And then they're going to assign more resources to that area. They're going to be more patrols. Um, any crime that is committed in that area is more likely to be prosecuted more harshly. So there's a number of different tactics. They're kind of leveled against these areas. Um, so that was one of the data-driven policing programs that was in effect here. Additionally, we have anchor points. Um, these are specific locations that are marked by the eyes that you see on the map, the little eye icons and the anchor points. These were additional locations that police had deemed to be, again, to be kind of anchor points for crime. And, and these were also targeted for additional policing, for additional patrols and, and other tactics as well, including um, having police try to evict people, um, additional surveillance. So there were many different tactics that were kind of used um, under, again, this policing program, Operation Laser. And then uh, PredPol was the other one. And the uh, where the the where we see the orange dots and the red dots on the map. So these were um, these were Predpol hotspots. Thank you, Chris. Those are Predpol hotspots, and these were areas that um, police were being sent to um, to supposedly patrol because Predpol is an algorithm that was essentially claimed to make predictions about where property crime was going to occur. Um, and what we found was that after a lot, again, after a lot of community-based research, um, going through a lot of documents, what we found was that instead of seeing these Predpol hotspots where we might imagine them to be kind of scattered around the area, 
Um, we did expect to see more of them showing up within the Skid Row community. What we found instead was that with this PredPol program, police were being essentially sent to these locations that mainly were outside the boundaries of Skid Row, and in some cases really lined up with the exact boundaries of Skid Row. Um, and so, so that is some of what we kind of uncovered in terms of where um, data-driven policing was targeting in the Skid Row community previously. Um, and the effect of that was that um, there are a few different things going on. The effect of that um, targeting was that um, there was kind of, we saw that there was kind of a containment effect. Um, there was kind of a policing of the borders of Skid Row is what was happening. And then also um, just displacement and brutality was additionally happening, um, you know, violation of people's rights, additional surveillance, uh, more heavy policing, all of these things were also happening um, within these areas as well. So that was some of the effect of the program previously. Um, and then in terms of where we're at today, uh, so what, what LAPD then transitioned to after these programs were shut down is that um, in 2020, they decided that they had to move on from these previous programs. They were going to do something that was more uh, that was more community based, and so they launched something that was called data and in, data informed community focused policing. Um, and this is a program that very much took a lot of those previous components that we saw and that we were just looking at, and kind of repurposed them, rebranded them, and essentially relaunched this program, um, data informed community focused policing into what LAPD is using today. So our fight since that time has kind of continued. Um, we've sought to learn more about that program specifically. What are the different components? Where are they targeting? What is the harm of that program? Um, and one of the things that we have found is that uh, kind of a centerpiece that they have been really focusing on with this program um, instead of our their Sarah projects, essentially, it's instead of targeting an area and calling it a laser zone or calling it an anchor point, now rebranded it to call it a Sarah project and to kind of give it this appearance that this is an area that, and they still call them problem areas, that's still the same, but this is now an area that is being policed um, together with community. So they kind of have brought in the community policing element much more as well. Um, and what we can do is we can look at a brochure that uh, we actually developed to take us through and talk us uh, talk through a little bit more about Sarah. Okay, one moment. Should I, oh, you're doing a tip, okay. Yeah, I found it, there you go, thank you. Okay, so this is the brochure that um, we developed to talk more about Sarah and learn more about, um, and to be sharing also with community a bit more about what this is. So um, as we can see, we talk about what is data informed community focused policing, and then we talk about what is Sarah. Um, Sarah is a four stage model of supposed problem solving. Um, this is what they're claiming that they do. Um, and Sarah, the four stages of that are scanning, analysis, response, and assessment. Um, here on this brochure, we have some information about each of those stages. And then what we can look at is kind of this diagram where we look at that further. Let's see. Okay, so essentially these are the four stages of uh, this SARA project. So when they declare an area to be a so-called problem area, um, they then open up a SARA report on it. 
Um, and then part of that Sarah report is going through each of these four stages of Sarah and kind of detailing how they're responding to it or adding information about what is going on at each stage. So again, this is kind of the premise. This is what they're claiming that they're doing. Um, so we'll just kind of take a look at what that is. So with scanning, this is essentially a stage where they are gathering information. Um, so this would involve just a lot of data gathering, um, a lot of compiling of reports. Uh, we see some of the ways that information is gathered, community surveillance is going on. Um, then from that, after they've done their scanning, they compile all that information. Um, that part is done in the analysis stage. Uh, this takes place at a center that um, is called the ACCIC, which stands for Area, I can't even remember what that stands for, Area Crime, it's probably on here somewhere, Area Crime, here it is, Area Crime and Community Intelligence Center, and essentially this is a room within a police station. Um, so that is where the analysis goes on, this is where they do their justification of what they're going to do, um, or why they're targeting that area. From there, we go into the response stage. And the response stage can be really a wide number of things. Um, it can be more patrols of the area, daily patrols of the area. Um, it can involve sweeps. It can involve bringing in other agencies, uh, bringing in um, collaborating with, uh, with different agencies and um, organizations that are more willing to work with police to kind of be amping up security and surveillance of an area. So response can be a whole bunch of different things, but it's basically how police are um, bringing resources and really cracking down on the area in a way that usually is very brutal and results in like displacement, um, eviction, um, essentially, through their eyes, what they're trying to do here is like eliminate, eliminate the problem. From there, from the response stage, they go to assessment and that is where they take a look at, okay, what were the crime reports prior? And then what were the crime reports after? Is this something that we need to continue doing or do we, are we, are we pleased with how this is resulted and are we going to close this Sarah report? Um, so those are the so that is essentially the four stages of Sarah, and again, this is what LAPD is using now. And just to be clear, the Sarah process, this whole process that we're looking at, this isn't something that's new. This is something that has been used for decades. It was used in the '80s. Um, it was just used a lot less widely. Um, so essentially, again, the reason that Sarah reports have been used more today is because of all that feed, um, all that um, criticism, having to shut down Operation Laser, having to shut down PredPol, um, kind of by ushering in this Sarah process and saying like, oh no, look, it's this process that we're going through and kind of putting these in the form of Sarah reports, having a, a Sarah report opened on each area. It's a way that LAPD is kind of giving this impression that they are like standardizing this response. Um, so that's kind of an overview of Sarah. And I'll just pause and see if folks have any questions on that. Um, or also if folks have anything to add about that. Okay. I, so, I just wanted to, please go ahead. Comment. Sorry. Uh, I think just a couple things I wanted to add. Thank you, Tiff, for that uh, that overview and uh, introducing folks to the Sarah uh, program. A um, couple things. One that uh, you know, when we talk about data driven policing, um, it's uh, the the idea or the practice is nothing new. It just you know data has been central to policing forever. And that's how they've been. Whether this was done by paper and pencil or you know just kind of so it's documenting information on people has been going on forever. 
I think it's the the way now with the advancements in technology and, and deployment of technology is uh, where the LAPD and, and law enforcement agencies try to, you know, just garnish their violence uh, uh, that they unleash on communities on the regular by then kind of giving us this veneer or this pseudoscience, this veneer of uh, of uh, computer-based uh, thing where the claim is that computers are race neutral. It's uh, the data that is directing us. It's that information, the history of uh, that information that we have gathered of uh, criminal uh, behavior or crime in certain areas. Um, but when, when, when we cut through a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, just uh, as Tiff was talking about uh, predictive policing and operational laser, Many times that information that was put in that was through reported information. I mean, these were not that convictions had happened and cases had been had been established and, and you know, so criminality had was established through the system. This is just a whole ton of information that constantly goes in, which provides and, and then it gets weaponized to target certain communities. So that's uh, that just wanted to kind of throw that in there that that's where the the data driven policing comes in. Then as far as Sarah is concerned, I mean that's really about uh, you know just what the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has been has been lifting for the longest time that uh, how surveillance and spying are are central to this thing that how criminalization then happens and how data gets manipulated uh, to assign criminality uh, to individuals, to assign criminality uh, to uh, uh, to communities. And in essence, what happens is that uh, we talk about it in the coalition that how land beneath our feet gets criminalized. It's the whole idea is to disrupt people's life to the extent that uh, in case of uh, uh, unhoused communities in Skid Row, that how they get harassed and intimidated on the regular under the guise of data-driven policing, uh, where the to make people's lives so miserable that they kind of self-banish themselves, like you know, then they that they leave. So this is how it goes back to the broader uh, political issue uh, around the city, and then this is the season for where the city is going to be, uh, you know, talking about the budget, and they are going to be approving budgets, and we will see that how you know the response to everything is through policing. So I just wanted to throw these things that you know when we when we look at these programs, we have to also very clearly. Uh, just be debunking them and and discrediting them because this is just a smoke and mirror. This is just a facade of supposedly computer aided and computer driven policing, uh, just to continue to to do what they have always done and how this information is weaponized and then people are just uh, criminalized and banished. Yeah, thank you for that, Ahmed. Uh, and I see your question here. In the chat, Maggie asking if terms like Sarah and data informed community focused policing, are they police terms? And <laughs> I see you, Pancake, shut it down. Absolutely. So, in terms of, um, yeah, so in terms of what is, so, so in terms of what is Sarah and if that is a police term, so Sarah is, I believe. I won't, I won't look it up this moment, but I, I know that that was um, started, I can't remember if it was started just by L, in LAP locally in the 80s or if it existed previously, but it is an approach um, that is used, um, it's kind of, it is widely, okay, let's see what Chris is saying here. Sarah model process was built out of problem oriented policing coined by Herman Goldstein, a criminologist. Okay, thank you. So there is our answer right there. I couldn't remember if it also has a base in like businesses, because I feel like it also kind of exists outside of policing. Um, but it looks like, and that's my memory of it as well. Thank you, Chris, is that it was something that was kind of created actually in response to feeling like um, police were being understood as just uh, responding to crime after the fact and wanting to kind of center them more and um, kind of integrate them into the community and give this kind of impression of them as being like problem solvers <clears throat> in the community. And so this Sarah model, this problem solving uh, model was developed. So that is the origin of that. And then data informed community focused policing. Yeah, and there's I'm sure there's a lot more information about that online. 
Um, but the, uh, yeah, data informed community focus policing is just completely made up. It's something that LAPD just kind of put together words um, to represent this program that essentially was just like they had to come up with something after Operation Laser was shut down. Um, so they came up with, OK, well, we're going to take, you know, data informed elements and data driven policing elements, and then we're going to take community policing elements and we're going to put them together. Um, and very much like, a, yeah, again, like a rebranding, just relabeling of the same things that they've always been doing. Um, and that's what we're definitely seeing when we look at where is being targeted and how they're targeting areas as well. Um, we're seeing that this is a continuation of, of what has what has happened previously. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And then, so yeah, what we can do is, and I'm not sure if you're able to, to share it, Chris, the map that you developed, um, but we did want to take a look at where those Sarah locations are today. So again, these are the new ways that LAPD is labeling an area. So previously they called them laser zones or anchor points. So the zone was kind of a larger area. The anchor point was more of a specific location. These were areas that were deemed criminal. Today, what they're using is they're calling these Sarah projects. And they're saying um, a Sarah project can be can be one store, like in some instances, it's like a liquor store. It can also be um, a block. It can be a, an entire zone or an area. Um, and so the way that we got this information, same as we did for Operation Laser and PredPol was by filing um, a demand for public records. And we did get back information showing us uh, where is being targeted um, in different communities. And one of those that we got was information on the Skid Row community. And if you're ready, Chris, we can share that. Um, Sorry, I, I can't tell if it's being shared. I, oh, you, we uh, were going back and forth a little bit. Oh, uh, okay. Because usually it highlights my screen anyway. Um, yeah, that... you, were, you were sharing it a couple times. How about now? It says no, that you... Yeah. I think it's just waiting. Oh, it says resume share, but it's not. Weird. Um, do you want me to do it again? Um, yeah, there, it, now we can see it. Wait, that's not the right screen though, sorry. That's okay. And just to shout out Chris, um, Chris has done, I should have said this right from the beginning when we were looking at the automating banish uh, maps, Chris has done just a tremendous amount of work in creating these maps um, for the coalition and as part of this work and uh, very much kind of took that up themselves to, to do that. And so we're just tremendously grateful to your, um, your work and your skill, Chris, as well. So... Yeah. Yeah, um, I did want to start off with um, this section right here. It's kind of like a screenshot of what a, a Sarah report document kind of looks like. Um, they talk about who's a client in the process, the location for it, um, some contact information, and the police assigned to it. And then from there, it follows uh, the three, the four parts in the Sarah process and a bunch of notes. Um, but yeah, this is a map. Did you want to talk about it? Yeah, I can because there's quite a bit going on here, and we and we know that. Um, but essentially, so what we're looking at here, and this should look pretty familiar compared to what we were looking at previously. Um, but so again, we'll start with just getting our bearings. So we're looking at the downtown area, and then sorry, just admitting folks. So again, just looking at the downtown area, and then if we're looking at these um, kind of the more green borders, uh, the larger border, those are the historical boundaries of Skid Row, kind of the boundaries that were established in 1976. Um, and then we still see, we still have on there the laser zones. These are the smaller boxes that Chris is hovering over now. Um, those were from, those do not supposedly exist anymore. Those are, those are part of the previous, um, policing program. 
Um, however, what we now see is this very large red area, and this is the SARA project that has been opened on Skid Row. Um, and we'll talk more about what is in that, um, but this is the area that it's covering. Um, and so this is going from Ceres on the east side and then on the upper west side that is um i believe that goes up to spring street south spring street and then at the sides the borders are fifth and seventh so it's that entire area um and then we see la can where la can is located as well and i'll just also well i won't, I won't touch on that yet we also see kind of a smaller area in there as well and that's to do with um, the downtown um, 2040 plan which we'll get into in a moment but in terms of just looking at where are these Sarah um, Sarah zones located so this is kind of a main one that we're seeing and then additionally I'm not sure if you can kind of scroll around Chris but we see like yes there's additionally the 700 block of Main Street. Yeah, and we can see that in the pop-up that Chris has there. That is also a Sarah project. Um, there's one right here. I think that's the 700 block of Grand. Is that right? Yep. 700 block of Grand is also a Sarah location. And then there's a few others. Um, I think 700 block of Jackson which is over here. And then for each of these, we can see a little bit of information on them. And then also there's kind of one, I think this is the cul-de-sac and I forget the name. It would be probably in this information. Yeah, this one, the client is Orsini and CD1 and uh, they've requested all these intersections. So they're basically surrounding this entire area. So they talk about policing the Burger King, the cul-de-sac, the alleys near around it, and clearing. And part of their work was to clear out, um, to contact the Department, Department of Sanitation and other folks to uh, basically banish the unhoused community there. Oh, and they also installed concrete barriers on the sidewalk for a supposed upcoming construction to the park property and their main thing was uh make sure that they uh sent out sanitation to banish folks build make sure that the construction for the barriers were built and that there was no one there afterwards and that was basically the full extent of their sarah report mm -hmm. and i'm just checking to see i'm not sure i can't see if uh if pancake is still with us but i'm just wondering if kind of just as we're looking at these different locations, um, like if anything is jumping out to folks or like perhaps folks that are more familiar with this area, like how this kind of matches up in terms of like, is this is this surprising to see that these are the areas that are being targeted? Um, just if folks had any familiarity with with these areas or any any thoughts on that at all. I do want to comment on MJ King's question. Uh, yeah, so what I noticed from reading all the documents here is that their primary goal when they talk to their clients, which is either the business owners or the, the, the private developers, is that basically in all every single Sarah project document that I looked at, they talked about um, increasing surveillance, which inconsistent with how do you bring in better surveillance cameras and how do you increase the lightning or how do you build um, architecture that, uh, what's that architecture called where you kick out on house communities, uh, anti-homeless architecture and stuff like that. So that's essentially like the first part is to like meet with all the business owners and the bids nearby to basically tell them to like do all these things to increase surveillance around yeah like for here they met with the senior engineer of eighth and grant department to discuss enhanced security measures they met with whole foods um and same right here they met with the brewery and stuff like that
Yeah. And in terms of like, just con comparing this and contrasting it to when we look at the previous um, data-driven policing programs that LAPD had been using, you know, what we're seeing is just a lot that it's, it's a lot of the same. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, this, the same areas are, have been designated for, for policing. Um, Main street is the existing border kind of a divider um, between Skid Row and the community that is rapidly gentrifying um, and that just a very heavily policed area right there. And um, so, yeah, I think just a confirmation that this is a continuation of the practices and um, as well as the like the policing tactics and brutality and um, anti homelessness tactics that have been already going on, and then um, <clears throat> and we'll just we can touch on the fact that so another thing that we have on this map is the the smaller zone that we see here, kind of within the larger historical boundaries of Skid Row, we also see this uh, smaller area that's not in red and it's not in red because that's not to do with policing. So this area, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with the downtown 2040 plan, uh, but this is a plan that has been developed by the city. I, be I believe it's still in process. Um, but the downtown 2040 plan is like this plan that the city has for the development of downtown, uh, for community services and also for um, rezoning um, and where determining uh, what type of housing will be allowed in different areas and different neighborhoods. So it's this plan that has been years in the making. Um, LA CAN has been part of a coalition of folks who have been uh, very invested and involved in providing feedback um, from the perspective of the residents of Skid Row, making sure that um, that that folks' voice are being heard and that they are getting input into um, the the development of this plan. And one of the outcomes, what is being proposed so far by the city, to do with how they want uh, you know existing Skid Row to either change or stay the same in this 2040 plan is that their plan is to have it shrunk down, reduced down to this smaller area that we see here. Um, essentially, I believe this is called the I by one zone. Um, and again, this is something that we talk about in automating banishment. And it is, as we can see, it's a much smaller area than the space that Skid Row currently occupies. So what we're seeing here is that the plan that the city has, this 2040 development plan, is very much to shrink down the size of the community of Skid Row in terms of uh, where services are, in terms of where very low income housing is allowed to this very small area. And the reason we have it on here is because we're very interested in how it lines up with these data-driven policing programs. Um, because again, what we understand about these policing programs is that they have a number of different effects. Some of them are containment, kind of keeping divisions, keeping borders in place. Um, and some of them are also pushing back on communities, displacing, harassing, evicting, um, completely banishing people. So we're very interested in what is that relationship between these policing programs and these development plans. Um, and I'll just pause and see if folks have any thoughts or questions on that as well. Or anything to add. I know we have a lot of folks here with a lot of knowledge about all of this. Okay, we can keep it moving then. Um, so what we can do is uh, I'd just like to share 
perhaps we can share um, the Sarah report itself and just take a look at um, what the Sarah report is. Um, and so as we're talking about our fight against Sarah and our fight against data-driven policing, we get that information about where is being targeted. And then also on these Sarah reports, they give us information about who is involved and also the ways that communities are being targeted. So um, if we can, it would be great to just take a look at one of those now. And this also kind of gives people an idea of what is the kind of information that we can get. And so this is like our question to all of you as well, you know, as we're wanting people to be joining us in this fight against status driven policing and joining us in this fight against Sarah projects. Uh, what is it that we want to be learning more about? Um, like, what are those questions we have? What are those possible documents that we can be asking for? Um, what are the things that we want to be uncovering so that we can be exposing and pushing back on these programs? So um, one of the you know most basic things that we did get already, as we've said a few times, is the Sarah report. Uh, let me pull that up now. Okay, so... This is what a Sarah report looks like. Um, so essentially what we see on the front here is at the top, they'll say, what was the opening date? Um, can folks see my cursor or no, probably not, right? You can, oh, good, that's nice. Um, okay, so yeah, we see the opening date here. Um, and again, so this is for that larger zone. This Sarah project report is for that larger zone that we were just looking at. So from series to spring and then between seventh and fifth, uh, we see the date that that was opened. Sarah projects are supposed to be opened for 90 days and then reevaluated. What we've seen with other divisions, um, not central division, is that very often a Sarah may be open for as long as a year and a half or longer. And we see at the top here, we see the extension. So sometimes they open up a Sarah report, they open it up on a certain date. Um, like Echo Park Lake is another example of a Sarah report that was opened up and then it kept being extended. So they're very often opened on a certain date, but then six months later, they're still open and then they'll file for an extension, they'll file for another extension. Um, and again, this is kind of not what the original premise of the Sarah, whole Sarah project report was when they initially launched it. And we're talking about it, of course, um, because it's never as they actually say. Um, the original idea was like, oh, this would be something that is a focus of the community for a while and then it moves on. But what we're seeing is that these are very long term projects and they actually will last for for months or even years. So one question that we have about this particular Sarah project is, is this still open today? Because we actually don't see a closing date on this Sarah report. So we see uh, who opened it and then we see the stakeholder. And I would like to pause and see if anyone has any, uh, we see it was a Para Los Niños uh, charter school, which is local to the area. And folks who are familiar with the area, um, folks who work in downtown, um, it does, does anyone have familiarity with that charter school and perhaps what is the community's relationship with that? Matos, I see you turning on your camera. Yeah, do you guys, do you, do you all have, and I'm not sure when, I may not notice when Dogon Jones joins us, but these are questions that, that we have for folks as well is just to learn more. Oh, I see Pancake, your hand up. Please, yeah, anyone? Um, okay, can you hear me? Can, yep. you, can, can yeah, you hear me? Okay, I want to say uh, happy new to everybody. You know, it's good to see you, Tiffany. Welcome back, Ahmed, uh, Shakir, Matios, the whole crew stopped at APD Spy. Um, first of all, the um, Paralas Ninos it is a um, they, well, preschool is uh, located right at Paralas Ninos. Um, right across from LA Can. Um, that school used to occupy where LA Can is now. Um, some of you may not know or may know that um, Caruso um, is on the board. 
Rick Caruso, he's on the board. So, um, you know, as far as um, with the Sarah report and how, again, you know, just painting a picture, uh, demonizing community, criminalization, uh, to me, it's the same old, same old. It's, it's more complicated now with the um, doling out of the enforcement of 4118, you know, 4118 and um, uh, like lots of and, you know, coming out their field workers and making promises. Oh, we're going to get you housing. Same old, same old. The parents of the cops, they just show up, but they're not doing anything. You know, it's like they're fixing like uh, the fear factor. Uh, being apprehensive, oh, this one is going to happen, and so forth. So, you know, their presence is, to me, is making it worse. You know, being in the field, engaging, you know, folks in our community, and, um, you know, the, um, those that are getting sick, not getting the proper um, attention, health-wise, so forth, so on. So, um, you know, we got to continue the work that we're doing you know, and uh, these programs being part of the equation and solution. What we're saying is not, and this is where we come in, you know, LA CAN and Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. We won't sleep. Uh, we know that these folks, they're not working. Like you introduced this, the same old, uh, different branding, but the same old, same old. So, um, Dogan's not here. He's over in the Merck Park. I believe he had to speak. As far as the um, uh, special enforcement zones, you know, there in the Merck Park, um, it's going to, you know, be enforced starting, I think, the end of this month, uh, starting um, um, the beginning of February. So, anyway, I just want to input that and, you know, hopefully something that I said, you know, got to, I, you know, um, gave attention to what we're really talking about. So um, that's what I have to say. Welcome back, Hamid. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's what I have to say. So um, and back to you, Tiff. Go thanks. for it. Thanks so much, Pancake. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Uh, I see a few hands. I'm not sure who was first, Hamid or Matthias. Go ahead, Matthias. Hey, yeah, just a quick addition that I hope, oh, yeah, I hope, um, General Dogon can speak on when they hop on. But, um, you know, recently, about a month ago, I don't remember the precise date, some LAPD officers had actually come up to LA CAN um, and threatened, you know, the folks who live just in front uh, with a sweep on a, on a given date. And they never followed through with that. Uh, but uh, this, this followed um, the recent expansion of 4118 which allowed um, the city to sweep encampments within 500 feet of a school. And so, you know, I think for a lot of folks, General Dogon primarily was raising uh, concerns around, uh, you know, Para Los Niños right across the street, um, because I'm guessing there's a history of friction there. And for folks that have visited LA Can during, you know, office hours effectively, uh, you may have seen that they do have like a rather militant looking security presence right in front. Um, so I just wanted to flag that um, that's been our, the other instance in which uh, uh, Para Los Niños has been raised uh, in relation to LA CAN. I'm hoping General Dogon can hop on to talk about that in more detail. That's great. Thank you for adding that. Hamid? Yeah, I just wanted to also uh, just, uh, you know, drawing those connections uh, uh, as you were sharing Operation Laser and predictive policing earlier, Tiff, that uh, it's 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 quite telling that in this one, uh, the community client is Para Los Niños, which is right across the street from where we are located, uh, right? But uh, But it reminds me of how uh, when we got those uh, uh, laser zone and the maps and everything else that how, you know, uh, uh, the area around Cal State Northridge was a laser zone. Uh, when we go into uh, the east side, Roosevelt High School, the area around that was a laser zone as well. So so this whole connection with uh, with places of learning and, uh, you know, then how they are sort of like, you know, if, uh, if in this case, obviously, this is, uh, as Martios was explaining, 
that this is in proximity to a school, that 500 foot uh, distance, that they criminalize that area and that land. But the, the connection between educational institutions and policing in the sense of, uh, you know, just assigning criminality uh, and justifying their violence, that, that, that constantly weaves through. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then some of the additional, oh, Shakir. Hey, yeah, sorry, my internet just got cut, so I missed a little bit of what Haman said, but I was just going to add something also about the Sarah and you know, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think what, I mean, you know, I hadn't realized that we had a Sarah report for them and for this location, and I think this really, I mean, it highlights a couple things. One is, um, you know, they labeled this obviously as a Sarah report for par is it par paralos ninos or paralos? I think that's three words. Anyway, um, you know, um, that location, but obviously there's a lot more going on in that location. Like Brother Pancake said, like that's literally across the street right from LA Can. There's also, you know, people living on the street right there in front of LA Can and around the rest of the block. So, you know, that's, even though they kind of use this as this entry point, as this anchor for their kind of community relations, like that's who they're obviously talking to. They're going to the charter school officials, they're going to the administration there, and they're having these conversations. That's kind of almost like a beachhead for their whatever activities are coordinating in the whole block and the area around it. Um, and so they use that as that's a kind of friendly entry point for them, and that's where they start. Likewise, it's like, you know, we've been hearing from Dogon and others who, um, you know, know the block well and have been working there a lot and have spent a lot of time there about kind of witnessing the school's um, increasing kind of collaboration with police. You know, like we mentioned, Mach just mentioned the, the cops stopping by and, and, and ask, you know, on kind of behalf of them. And, you know, what we've seen about the area being designated a special enforcement zone and all of, all of that happening is all of that doesn't kind of happen by accident or in a vacuum. It happens through these kinds of direct collaborations with, um, with yeah, businesses or entities, or organizations that are willing to collaborate with police. They work with them to kind of develop this basis for the increase in police and the increase in, in um, surveillance and criminalization. That that's like that's when we say this is part of like you know it says that informed community focused policing on the top. That's the community policing aspect that, you know, when we think about community policing, you might, you hear that term, you might think of the examples of, you know, cops playing basketball with kids or like handing out toys and those kinds of things. And that is part of it too. That's one part of the kind of, you know, how they build relations. But another is this kind of direct outreach continuously, you know, opening a direct line of communication with the, with the kind of neighborhood organization or whatever and then developing those relationships that they're then now using to say, oh, well, we're receiving complaints about this. We're really, you know, we've heard about all these issues. It's because of this kind of relationship that they deliberately built with the school that now they use that to kind of um, go after the parts of the neighborhood that aren't cooperating with them, that aren't kind of collaborating with them. Yeah, thank you for filling that in as well, Shakir. Um, yeah, and that's right. It's like, it's like, just as with the previous programs with like Operation Laser and who was de decided to be criminal and what areas were decided to be criminal. It's more that they look at an area and they pick an area ahead of time and then they see what information can be gathered on it. Um, they go out and get that information after the fact. Um, it's very much shaped in that way. Um, and so yeah, and it's very interesting to see, like we see on here as well, like who is involved in the SARA process. We see that the CCEA bids are involved, which I understand, you know, LA Can has a long relationship, I think specifically with that bid as well, um, fighting against uh, the bids in the downtown area. That's the bid, the business improvement district that covers um, Skid Row, so that, you know, LA Can has to pay dues to it and as part of it. And it stretches down further too. Okay. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. I also want to add a little bit more onto that. Um, so I read the entire log from there, and I believe they only met with uh, para los niños maybe like once or twice. 
to talk about general like safety procedures, but they mostly their involvement started off right away um, by meeting with the reset team, which is the team that um, patrols skid rolls particularly. And there they advise to create a high visibility patrol section. So it means like, you know, be very visible about your patrolling. And from there on, it seems like they um they, in addition, talk to the bids and the industrial areas, and they even talk about how they share problem locations, which they actually call them anchor points, even though they shouldn't, right? And then um, they provide crime stats and wanted flyers to the security teams there. So it's kind of like a, also like brings on the history from Laser of providing like wanted bulletin boards on neighborhoods. Um, so they do that as well. Um, and they have also close collaboration with LAHSA. Um, and part of like the effect of this was, I think, 47 arrests, two impounded vehicles where people were living in there. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of just, you could tell really that the priorities, what it is, um, as opposed to, um, I guess, the youth, right? Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Chris. I'm, I'm, and thank you again for taking the time to go through these in more detail. Um, yeah, and just to give folks an idea of like what else is in a Sarah report. Um, so essentially on this first page where we have this information, they do give us a brief description of, um, you know, for each stage, the scanning analysis, response and assessment. They do fill in a little bit. It's usually a very not, yeah, descriptive statement about what's going on there um so like with scanning that's where they're trying to they're saying that this is where they identify the problem and they basically are just describing some of the things that are located in the area um uh, sros so single residency occupancy i believe is that what that stands for um low-income housing for folks uh, missions cold storage facilities business public parks parking lots Numerous stakeholders made requests for extra patrol and then something redacted. Um, and then analysis. And I'm really interested that I think for, I can't remember if it's for all of these, but they have the analysis redacted. And I'm not sure, um, Shakir, if that's something that we can push back on at all. Like, I believe that you can legally push back on redactions or say that they're unnecessary or something, but it is interesting that they redact that part. Um, yeah. yeah, we'd have to look at it. I mean, there's a lot of um, kind of excuses or basis for redaction that they can say, like if it, you know, is kind of private information about a person or if it's investigative or, yeah. But um, yeah, it's worth looking into. We've, we've been able to push back on redactions before. Yeah, um, okay. Um, and then, yeah, just Chris has, has named a few other things that we see in these notes. Um, we see that central cars will conduct ex extra patrols, reset units, um, which reset is a uh, unit within LAPD that only patrols within the Skid Row community. Um, uh, and will, and then redacted, will receive information periodically on some of our problem locations which is very interesting as well. Um, and as Chris noted, they do at some point reference anchor points. So following that information on the first page, they then get into the log. And this is where they say on this date, this is who did it, this is their serial number. And then this is what they, this is what they did. So they kind of keep track of like some of the things that they, that they did in relation to this Sarah project or Sarah location. Um, and we can see, again, it's interesting to see like 6th Street and St. Julian. Um, we see that popping up a lot, um, those areas that were previously um, associated with the previous laser zones, because um, that was 5th, 6th, and 7th between St. Julian and San Pedro is where those previous laser zones were. So every time we see that popping up, it's like that's the same area that was previously um, listed as a laser zone. Um, Meeting with bids, meeting with security. I was just looking for that reference to the anchor points. It's in the response section, so you, you pass it. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. 
Right there, the first sentence. Central A cars will conduct extra patrol, patrol in the major anchor points in Skid Row. I skipped right over it. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and you say that in your chat as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. So yeah, that's a really interesting statement that they just give us right there. We'll conduct extra control, patrol in the major anchor points in Skid Row. And they could just be using this. We know that sometimes they use terminology, you know, they just use the same terminology they've always used. We know that they use the term chronic offender to describe people that they believe that they describe as, you know, chronically offending um, for us that had that term has well. And for a lot of people, that term had a very sp specific significance because it, it meant people who were being um, labeled under the Operation Laser Program, but we will sometimes see that term popping up in other places. Um, so it may be, you know, that they have continued to use this term anchor point, um, again, which was being used under Operation Laser um, to mean, maybe they're still using that term to mean that these are points that are, um, they call them anchors for crime. But for us, I think this gives us an opportunity to be um, like, I would be really interested um, for us to file a PRA that is like specifically to learn more about this Sarah project and like to just focusing on this Sarah project. Um, and perhaps that's one of the things that we can ask about is reference to anchor points. Um, uh, another. Sorry. Right. Another interesting thing about this one is uh, in one of their logs, they mentioned, sorry, um, meeting with Parks and Rec over security measures at the park, pending construction project timeline, Chauvin trial preparations and open table discussions. And if, if y'all know Chauvin, Chauvin, I don't know that name, uh, that's a police officer um, as part of the George Floyd um, murder. Yeah, so that's later down. So I don't I don't know how they're related to that, but apparently that was a big part of the discussion. Um, that's a little that's more down. Yeah, and I'm scrolling down. And also, if anyone is interested in looking at this uh, information in more detail, um, please contact us and we'd be more than happy to share it with you as well. These are public documents um, that belong to the community. Uh, I think it's over Yeah, I don't see that. I think this is the last page. No. Yeah, keep going. There you go. Okay. 415. So meeting with Parks and Rec at this location, discuss security measures at park pending construction project timeline, Chauvin trial preparations, open table discussion. I wonder if that is like, with Derek Chauvin was the, the cop who murdered... George Floyd. Yeah. So I wonder, I can only expect that that would be that they were anticipating protest, perhaps that that was a date that, or something. I, I think it was around the time of the verdict. Yeah. As someone said, like for, because Chauvin was on trial and then, um, yeah, I remember they were, they were, they, they have all kinds of stuff. They actually had a lot of different community policing type stuff planned um, in response to the verdict. Like, like they had met with a bunch of um, like civil rights kind of nonprofits and other quote unquote leaders to do this like press conference in response to the verdict. So it's it's interesting that it also shows up here that they were um, yeah the meeting with Parks and Rec and all that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Any other points that you wanted to call out on this or folks had any other questions about this, but kind of this is an overview of like the type of information that we get on these locations. Um, it's obviously very useful because it does give us insights into some of the specific activities that it's going on, some of the um, people who were involved, some of the collaborators who were like the supposed community partners, um, collaborators with police on this, 
Um, I also want to point out, though, that it does not, uh, very obviously, it does not give us the whole picture of what is going on. Like they have these logs of things that are happening, but it's it's just, it is one narrative about what is going on. Um, and just we're reminded of that, like when, for instance, when you look at the Sarah project for Echo Park Lake that had that massive raid and eviction. Um, I know that was in March. Again, I'm getting my years confused. Was that 2021? Uh, but when that happened, there was a Sarah report opened up on it. And if you look at the exact days of that raid, it's like they basically are like patrol happened this day and we installed a fence. So it was just very, you know, they essentially say as much in these logs as they want to. So it does give us some insight. Um, but it's just kind of another piece of the another piece of the puzzle. Um, in this instance, though, it does give us some insight too into like some of the things that they are going on. It's very interesting to see that use of the word anchor points. So it gives us things that we can be asking more about. So, um, and then Joe, I saw your question as far as um, how often, are, like, like how often are these reports updated and do we have um, a standing PRA or another mechanism for keeping this up to date? Um, that's a great question because it's the answer is that they're not updated often enough at all. So we have gotten a number of Sarah reports through PRAs that we have filed, uh, but LAPD has been very slow to respond to them. And then um, I myself haven't been keeping up as much on kind of prompting them, getting at them to, to respond back to us. So they have been very slow to release information. Uh, most of what we've gotten has been Sarah reports from, I think, 2020, and we've gotten some from 2021, but we basically demanded all of them, and we've gotten kind of a, a very small percentage of those um, from when LAPD makes public updates about Sarah reports. You know, we know that, like, they easily have over 100 at any one time. And so we should be getting a lot more of those. Um, and, and again, that's something that with us having this meeting and kind of refocusing in this year and focusing our fight against data driven policing, that's something that, um, that we are really asking to see who is interested in joining with us um, on that part as well in terms of responding to LAPD's, um, what they've released already, kind of taking a look at that PRA that we also that we already put in a request for, um, putting in our response and uh, demanding more information and seeing what other information that we can get from them. So that's something that we are very much going to be pushing forward with. And if folks are interested in joining us on that specifically, like that aspect of it, we we very much welcome your participation. Um, did that answer your question, Joe? Yeah, thank you. Sorry to take the time. Um, I guess in terms of participating, should I just email you, Tiff, or is there another, what's the right mechanism for that? Yeah, you can uh, send an email to stop LAPD spying at gmail.com. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Matios. So um, I'm not sure if we want to, like, as we mentioned, that was the, so this is the Sarah report for that one zone. I'm not sure if we wanted to take a look at, um, are folks interested in taking a look at perhaps any other specific areas? Like, let's see, this is Jackson Street, the 700 block of Jackson Street. It might be interesting to take a look at the main street. Okay, so this one is the 700 block of main street. And again, this is just a really interesting area because this is kind of that famous, infamous divider between Skid Row and gentrification, the, the downtown developments. Um, so we see that this one, does have an opening date and does have a close date. Um, so again, a question would be, is this still open? It seems very likely that they would have kept this open 
or reopened it at some point. So we see, again, when they have a description of the area, the analysis is completely blocked off, which really is intriguing as to what they're putting there. Um, who are the partners? Let's see. Okay, the client stakeholder is blocked off. So we don't know who that is. And then, well, that's all we have on that one. There's nothing else. Okay. All right. So we can do some more digging on that one. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure if folks have any other questions about some of these other areas. That's very interesting, Chris. So Chris is saying in every single report, LAPD requested to continue the Sarah project. That's really interesting. Okay. So, and is that something that you're seeing, like, for instance, on the, like, usually on the back page? So this is a back page of one. We've continued to meet with stakeholders, directors, and residents. So this is for the Grand Area one, 700 block of Grand Area. Um, we've continued to educate the community. We are requesting continuance to further monitor the area and continue to meet with stakeholders. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's very interesting. So I'm not sure if folks have additional questions about this, um, but if not, I think the only other thing, hang on, let me stop sharing. Okay. Okay, so the only other thing I wanted to share with us is just to, um, which we've kind of touched on already, is just to um, take a look at the PRA that we currently have open on the SARA projects. And again, invite folks to join us in that um, as we push for more information. And then also think about what do we want to put in our next PRA. Um, Okay, thank you, Chris. So Chris is sharing there in the chat. So that is the link to the map that um, Chris has created that shows those um, Sarah locations. And in terms of if we're thinking about, um, so what I'll do now is I'll show the, in terms of information that we have already requested and some of the information that we've got already, um, this is a PRA, hang on, let me make sure it's the right page. Okay. Okay, so we should be looking at here, this is a PRA that was opened up um, by our Sarah working group uh, last February. Um, and this, so this is just to give folks here an idea. These are some of the things that we asked for. This PRA is still open. Um, so these are some of the things that we've asked for already that we are still interested in. So we asked for all Sarah reports, um, all records, memos, reports regarding the Area Crime and Community Intelligence Center. So again, that's kind of that unit within LAPD that is supposedly um, in charge of doing this analysis part of the Sarah report and kind of determining and providing that justification for why a project should remain open or why a project should even be targeted at all. Um, we asked for information on the neighborhood engagement areas, which um, seem to be sometimes kind of used um, in the same way that a Sarah location or Sarah report is used. So they seem, seem to be sometimes interchangeable labels, uh, neighborhood engagement areas. Um, so we ask for a few different things here. And then we ask for, let's see, all ComStat reports or documentation that reference Sarah projects. So that's based on the understanding that in CompStat meetings, which are, I believe, still monthly meetings where LAPD kind of top supervisors um, have to go in and have this conversation about how they are performing with regard to uh, reports of crime. 
part of that conversation that they have is about Sarah projects. So we ask for any documentation around that. We ask for email communications. Um, we ask for a lot of email communications. And then we ask for, at the end, we ask for all mission sheets, mission packets, or daily mission sheets that are created, again, by these local um, ACCIC centers. Um, and we know that those exist because that is something that is, is actually described when LAPD talks about data-informed community-focused policing. They talk about how these crime intelligence centers generate these mission packets and these daily mission sheets. So that is part of our PRE as well. In terms of how they've responded, what information have we already received? We can see here, we've gotten very little. They gave us some information that I think we already had. So we had some documents that were just kind of, I think some of these were public already, or we may have had. Um, these bottom three are kind of more general. And then we got four, uh, including one of those that we looked at today, that were giving us information on the SARA locations uh, for Northeast, for Mission, for Hollenbeck, and for Central Division. So that's some of the information that we've received already. Um, again, we are very much interested in now kind of revisiting this and um, filing a response with LAPD demanding more information. So um, yeah, if folks are interested in joining us in that, then please do um, give us your information. We'll be in touch with you. And um, as far as other aspects of our fight against Sarah, uh, some of the things that we have been working on and are still interested in working on are developing um, pop ed materials, um, a Sarah like pamphlet or brochure that kind of goes into, which actually we have that, we have that trifold already that talks about the process, but we wanted to get into more detail in terms of like, what does this actually mean when it is unleashed in a community and giving more examples of that, um, outreach materials. Um, and, uh, so yeah, if folks are interested in joining us in that fight, uh, please do get in touch with us. And again, it, I think that we are going to be kind of continuing with this focus on trying to uncover what we are learning about these locations in the downtown area, uh, learning more about that, um, and then also kind of looking at what other areas of the city have been deemed SARA locations. So I will just pause there and see if folks have questions or comments. Right on. Okay. Um, and anything to anything to add, Matios uh, or Hamid? You've been a part of our fight against Sarah for a while. Um, no, just uh, oh, uh, maybe let folks know when the data-driven policing working group meets. So if they want to be a part of this, fight. that's an excellent idea. That's an excellent idea. Uh, Matios, did you have anything? No, no, that sounds good. I, I was just going to plug social media surveillance if folks are interested in uh, plugging into that. We meet at Thursdays at three o'clock. You can email us at Stop LAPD Spying and I'll send that info to you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Hamid, for that prompt. I forgot that part. Um, yeah. So our, um, if folks are interested, we do have a number of different working groups um, within our fight against data driven policing. Um, Matos just named one of them, social media surveillance. Um, we also have community policing. Uh, we have the Sarah group and um, a good place to kind of plug in and learn more about some of these different um, aspects of our fight and the different things we have going on are our monthly working group meeting that happens on Monday. It's always the Monday before the coalition, coalition's general meeting. Um, so yes. It's it's uh, it sometimes falls on different weeks, but it's it's typically like the third Monday of the month. Um, it is posted on the coalition, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition calendar that we have on our website. So that is a place that you can get that information. Um, you can also email us to be a part of our mailing list. And yes, yeah, always the Monday preceding the coalition general meeting. 
And um, I had one other thing. And oh yeah, the only other thing is that um, we do intend to be starting to have regular meetings of our Sarah working group again. Um, we're thinking especially that, especially with this focus in the Skid Row area, it would be nice to be holding some of those meetings in person um, at LA CAN so that we can actually be kind of looking at some of these materials with folks and talking with folks um, in person. Um, we will kind of see how that develops, but but that is something as well. So if folks are interested in joining our Sarah working group, uh, let us know as well. And we are going to get those meetings started again. So that was everything that I had for the evening. Are there any questions or comments? All right, any community announcements? Does anybody want to share any announcements uh, with folks here about upcoming events or anything? Uh, I've got one. Um, <laughs> Go. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, yes, uh, the coalition, specifically our War on Youth Work Group, has been uh, working with these fourth through sixth graders at Steam to the Future. And they're having a, they have these regular community days and uh, they'll be doing another one on February 3rd, February 4th, which is a Saturday. Um, there isn't a flyer uh, yet out for it, but it's typically around 11 a.m. And are you, I'm being told it's 12 to two. Um, and uh, our youth specifically will be doing a workshop on the stuff they've been talking about and they've been focusing on kind of an organizing 101 uh, abolitionist thing where they've been replicating our model here at the coalition. So if you want to see some cool, cute, rad kids, come on over um, and check out the work we've been doing. Awesome. That sounds great, Matias. Thank you. All right, folks. If we, there are no other announcements, I think that is it for the evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll join us in our fight. Thanks Thank so much, everyone. Thank you, Tiff. Thanks, Tiff. All right, good evening. Everyone have a good night.